Welcome and good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'd like to go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us for K-State Garden Hour series hosted by K-State Research and Extension. My name is Cassie Homan and I'm the horticulture agent for the Post Rock Extension District. We are very pleased that you could all join us for this very successful webinar series. It appears that Kansans really love to garden. This webinar series was founded out of a need to continue to provide extension education related to horticulture and gardening. Everyone involved in the development of this series is an extension professional for K-State. Most of us have a background in horticulture education or a related discipline, but most of all, we each have a love for gardening and the natural environment. Each week, we feature a new topic related to gardening and horticulture. Our goal is to meet the needs of new gardeners as well as seasoned gardeners. We have been able to share topics related to pollinators, tomatoes, indoor plants, and native landscapes. You can find these additional topics on our website, the Horticulture and Natural Resources website, which our moderator, Brooke, will send the link for that in the chat. We have uploaded all of the previous recorded webinars there. This is also where you can find upcoming topics for our Garden Hour series. We have also been posting events on our K-State Horticulture and Natural Resources Facebook page, and I'll have Brooke send the link for that as well. So be sure to like and share and use the hashtag K-State Garden Hour to help us promote the series. Before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping notes. You may have noticed that you are not able to unmute your mic. We will keep the mics muted for the presentation, so this will help with background noise. As you know, we do have a lot of participants today, and we want to ensure that everyone has the best experience possible. With that being said, please keep your video turned off. If you do not turn your video off, we'll manually turn off your video just to help with the internet broadband and connectivity. As previously mentioned, we have a moderator today. Our moderator is Brooke Garcia, who is the training support specialist for the Department of Entomology. If you have any questions throughout the pre presentation, please send them over the chat. Um, you have the ability to send them privately to Brooke um, or you can just send them to the public. Brooke will keep track of the questions that come in, and then at the end we'll have a Q&A session with our speaker. We will do the best to get to all questions, but in the event that we do not answer them all, we will be uploading additional resources um, on that K-State H&R website. Um, that will also be where other references are for this presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, who is Dr. Raymond Cloyd. He is a professor, professor and extension entomology specialist. His research and extension program involves pest management and plant protection in greenhouses, nurseries, landscapes, turf grass, conservatories, interior scapes, Christmas trees, vegetables, and fruits. Dr. Cloyd is the extension specialist in horticulture entomology for the state of Kansas with major clientele that includes homeowners, master gardeners, and professional and commercial operators. So please give us a few moments while um, Dr. Cloyd shares his screen. Okay, are we ready? Are we ready? Yes, you're good to go. Okay, well, Good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased uh, to have everyone here today to hear some uh, bug talk. And if you don't know what your speaker looks like, this is what he looks like today. And yes, that is Venice in the background. Um, so the, the title of the presentation is Bugs Galore, Bagworm, Japanese Beetle, Mosquitoes, Ticks, and Other Related Bugs. I added ticks because of the timeliness of the presentation. Um, so what are we gonna talk about? Well. This is the overview of the presentation. We're gonna talk about the state insect of Kansas, bagworm. Then we'll talk about Japanese beetle, mosquitoes, ticks, other bugs, and then question the discussion afterward. Okay, so if everybody's ready to go, we'll go to the first one, bagworm. This is a young bagworm. Uh, right now, the bagworms are probably at this stage feeding on most plants, broadleaves, and conifers. And this is the life stage that's very susceptible to most of the insecticide applications I'll be talking about, okay? So 
Later on, what will happen is the bagworms, they create this encasement and then they'll come out occasionally and feed in and out, uh, feeding on conifers, many types of broadleaf plants. Okay, so the target is that when they're about a quarter to an eighth, well, let's say an eighth of an inch to a quarter inch, that's when they're very susceptible to most of the commercially available insecticides. The first one I'm going to talk about is uh, it's called Bacillus thuringiensis kirastachii, also known as BTK. And those of you from Wichita, I do apologize for that because that means something else down there. Uh, this is one of our most selective insecticides. It only kills caterpillars and, and bagworms is of course a caterpillar. When you're using BTK, you want to get them when they're young. And the reason is this is a stomach poison. Uh, that means they have to ingest it or consume it to be negatively effective. So when they're, when they're young and when they're small, they don't have to eat as much material and consequently they're killed much quicker. When you make applications of Bacillus thuringiensis kirstachii, you make them in the early morning because the material is susceptible to UV light degradation and you wanna cover all plant parts. Again, I cannot stress, this is not a contact insecticide, it's a stomach poison. They have to eat it to be negatively affected. Okay, another one that I highly recommend at this time of year is called spinosad. Spinosad is the active ingredient in a number of compounds. You can see a product here that has bagworm on the label. Uh, spinosad is also a stomach poison or also we call an ingested material, which means it has to be eaten by the bagworm caterpillars to be negatively affected. Another widely used product is called Captain Jack's Dead, Dead Bug Brew, nice, nice, name and it also contains spinosad and there you see uh, kills bagworms. So what we recommend is when you're using either BTK or spinosad you want to make weekly applications for about five weeks starting from late May which we're gone and all the way to about mid-June. Now that's going to depend on environmental temperatures. Right now because of the cool temperatures we experienced in the spring there's about a week to two week delay in the egg hatch of the bagworms. But these are the products you wanna use right now. You have to make weekly applications for about five weeks. The reason for that is twofold. Number one, the eggs don't all hatch uh, at the same time. Secondly, bagworms will balloon, which means they get blown on wind currents from other areas and then they'll land in a new location. Okay, so that's why you need to make multiple applications throughout uh, the season, especially right now till about, probably about till the end of June. If you don't see any bagworms, don't spray. These materials are only gonna be effective when bagworms are present. Okay, now when we get later on in the season, this is too late to deal, use either dipel or spinosad. What happens here is that the form we call the brown or green cap stage, and then the females will stay in the bag. The males become a winged individual. They emerge from the bottom and they mate with the female. Whenever you see bags with papery brown cases at the base, that was a male bagworm. The females, after they've mated with the males, they will move on in development and lay about 500 to 1,000 eggs in the bag. And that's how bagworms overwinter as, in, as the egg stage. Okay, so each female bag consequently can contain between 500 to 1,000 eggs. Well, what do you do at that point? Well, our favorite methodology is hand picking bagworm bags. And so if you grab a bag and you squeeze it, like this little critter's coming out, uh, that's probably a female. Uh, she's gonna get ready to lay her complement of eggs. So another, I think a really entertaining way to keep kids busy is this is if you squish bags, you get what we call bagworm goo. And what's really becoming popular is uh, bagworm paint gun goo paintball goo and that is kids go out there they grab the bags and they squirt each other with the bag worms and they get green well this keeps them gets them out of the house gets them out of their technology ipad cell phones whatever and they have a lot of fun outside so uh again insects are are doing great uh are really enhancing the quality of life uh and, uh, and bag worms is one of those well if you're going to walk the walk talk the talk I can't think of anything more desirable and pleasurable as being out on a July, August day picking bagworms 
baghorn bags off plants. Here I am, take them off our juniper. Now, what do you do with them after this? Well, number one is don't throw them on the ground. That's not what you wanna do. What you wanna do is you want to take a bucket, fill it with one part uh, soap solution, nine parts water, fill it up and throw your bags in there. Bagworms do not like soapy solutions and they get really agitated and they hate it. They start cussing and stuff like that. And then you take that after 50 minutes and dump it into a sunny area. And that's usually where they'll end up dying. Okay. Don't put your bags in a tote, whatever, because they are going to crawl around and you're going to have a garage full of bagworms in your car or whatever. Okay, I talked about bagworms enhancing quality of life. What's happening is people will have these bagworm weekend handpicking gatherings. What they do is they go out and pick all the bags off their trees and shrubs. And you can see they're, they're kind of social distancing, but there's no masks being worn. Okay, that's okay. They're outdoors. They light the bags up and they burn them up. And then they talk to each other. There's no cell phones, iPads, or any of the technological gizmos out there. And so bagworms are really bringing families back together again. And this is awesome to see. Okay, uh, this is what we call the really extreme measure of dealing with bagworms. From the extension standpoint, we're not recommending it at this time because of some of the harmful side effects, but psychologically, it is really pleasing. The problem is you burn your trees down in addition to taking out the bagworms. Okay, so at this point, we're not making this as a recommendation from an extension standpoint. Well, we have, uh, I developed a new publication last year called Bagworm Insect Pest trees and shrubs, and you can get it from the bookstore, uh, the KSU bookstore, and I'll talk about that near the very end. Well, that's bagworms. Let's move on to pest number two, Japanese beetle. Japanese beetle adults, as you've seen here, feed in a wide diversity of plant material, and we'll cover that as we proceed through the presentation. But first, you have to understand that Japanese beetles have an annual life cycle. Most of the life stages are in the soil. They're only out as adults for about three months. Here we are in mid-June and the adults will be coming out. Of course, that'll vary depending on environmental conditions, including rainfall and temperature. But most of the time they're in the soil and that's why they're considered a turf grass pest later on in August of September when the turf grass is stressed and the second and third instar larvae are feeding on the turf grass. For today's presentation, I'm gonna focus in on the adult life stage. Okay, first of all, we have to tell the difference between a green June beetle adult on the left and a Japanese beetle adult on the right. Green June beetles are metallic, dull gray, large, they don't fly very well, they tend to run into people in buildings, whereas Japanese beetles are very beautiful. They have iridescent uh, coppery wing coverings, but what really sets them apart from all the other scarab beads that is the family in the order Coleoptera, is the white tufts of hair on the end of the, of the end of the elytra or the abdomen, ranging from 10 to 14 hairs. That's how you identify Japanese beetle adults from all other scarabid insects. A little bit of background about Japanese beetle. They are native to Japan. They were introduced in 1916 in Riverton, New Jersey. And the adults are present primarily in the summertime, June, July. Sometimes we see them into September, October, depending on rainfall and temperatures that occur in late spring, early summertime. They feed on a lot of plant material, over 300 plant species. Uh, the adults are a third to half an inch long. But again, the, the, the distinguishing morphological characteristics are the white tufts of hair that are around the periphery of the abdomen. The adults feed on leaves, flowers, and fruits, and the adults live about 30 to 45 days. They are more active on warm sunny days, like most insects and mite pests, and they tend to feed in the upper leaf surface resulting in what we call skeletonization. And I have several examples of that uh, during the course of this presentation on Japanese beetle. Japanese beetle feeds on a wide diversity of ornamental plants, primarily those in the rosaceae family. That includes rose, crab apple, cherry, and plum, but they also feed on linden, uh, Virginia creeper. Again, like I said, over 300 species of plant material, so they're very prolificous. Well, here they are feeding, and of course, there's those white tufts of hair that they have. They tend to extrude their, their hind legs during the feeding process. Um, now, when you're, when you're out for three months, 
as an adult, you have to be very efficient. And insects are extremely efficient. And so when the adults are out, they only have two things on their mind, sex and food. And to be really efficient, it's also at the same time. Now, this is not insect pornography, but this is the male uh, copulating with the female because in three months, they got to get it done and then they get a female lays eggs and then they're in the larval stage. This is the damage on Tilia cordata, literally flinted. This is called skeletonization. They tend to feed in the epidermal layers in between the leaf veins and that gives these plants these typical skeletonization appearance. Here's what they do to roses. Uh, they, they can macerate roses in a very short period of time, but you can see again, we call that skeletonization where they're feeding primarily between the leaf veins in the epidermal leaf tissue. This is one of my favorite images that's on the wall of my house. This is Japanese beetle adults, an image I took five, six years ago, feeding on rose flowers. Why is this a problem? Well, twofold. One, when the Japanese beetles start feeding on roses, the roses give off some, we call host plant, or we call them organic volatile compounds. Well, those volatile organic compounds will attract more Japanese beetles. In addition, the Japanese beetle adults themselves will give off aggregation pheromones, and those aggregation pheromones will lure more Japanese beetles. So in a short period of time, uh, you can see why Japanese beetles just overwhelm a rose flower. And this is what you don't want to see. Uh, this is not a rose you're going to take to your American Rose Society, uh, but this is the damage that Japanese beetles beetles can do during the feeding process. I love this image. <laughs> this is a peach, uh, a peach being fed upon. Of course, they're getting business as usual, but they feed on the fruit of many trees and shrubs uh, and also fruit trees. And this is a, uh, a grower in the middle part of Kansas that had a massive infestation of Japanese beetles about two or three years ago. And obviously, uh, that's going to be, that could be an economic loss. So what do we do about Japanese beetle adults? Uh, it's very unfortunate that over the last 50 to 60 years, we haven't made too many efforts in using insecticides and non-selective. I think what's available today was available probably about 30, 40 years ago. But the management strategies include scouting, removing weed hosts, uh, like pokeweed uh, is one of the weeds, trapping, handpicking, and insecticides. So this is what we call the Japanese beetle adult trap. I don't know why these things are sold. It should actually be legal to sell them. Uh, what they are is you set them out in the yard and this is a baffle. And what can happen in a short period of time, these things can be overwhelmed with Japanese beetle adults. Uh, what's the problem with these? Number one, they're gonna lure more Japanese beetles than you'll ever see in your garden. Japanese beetle adults can fly four to six miles um, on their way. They may land on plants and start feeding uh, before they even reach these traps. If you're in an irrigated field or an area where people irrigate their lawn, you can increase the prospects of grub populations and then consequently grub damage due to lar larval feeding on the turf grass. So there's some really good studies that have shown that uh, these uh, really can be more problematic than helping deal with Japanese beetle adults. Here's another example of another trap for Japanese beetle adults uh, that's sold. So what is involved in these traps? Well, first of all, on the top is what we call a pheromone lure. This attracts the males. Right underneath it is a floral attractant, and this attracts the females. So when you put these traps out, you're luring both the adult males and the adult females. Now, this is one of the traps that's out there, and I wanna highlight the floral lure, eugeniol and geraniol. Those are two plant-derived volatiles that are emitted by rose flowers when they're fed upon. So these are actually natural compounds that have been that are used in these Japanese beetle traps to lure the females. That's the female, the floral lure. The sex lure or the the pheromone is to attract the males. So that the reason why roses are so widely fed upon is because they emit volatiles. Eugeniol and geraniol that will attract Japanese beetle adult females. 
Here is an example of a Japanese beetle trap. This is two years old and it was still attracting Japanese beetle adults. This is a jar that's uh, right across my office. I look at it on a regular basis. But yes, you can capture a uh, lots and lots of Japanese beetles. But again, uh, they can cause substantial plant damage either through direct feeding by the adults as they come in or when the females lay eggs in, in moist turf grass. So what can you do? Well, hand picking can be done on a small scale. And there's a, a several studies that have shown the way to do it. Japanese beetle adults is to go out three times per day. Yes, three times per day and pick off Japanese beetles. The reason why you do that is if you can pick off the Japanese beetle adults, then the flowers or the leaves will not give off volatiles and then you will minimize the migration or aggregation of Japanese beetle adults on the plants. Uh, I don't know if many of us have that much time right now, but that is an option. The main way of dealing with Japanese beetle adults is still the use of insecticides. And there's many pesticides out there that are commercially available for use on roses at garden centers and nurseries. Um, when you're using insecticides against Japanese beetle adults, the Japanese beetle adults, it will kill them, the leaves and the flowers. The problem is that many of these materials are old time carbamates or pyrethroids, which means they're broad spectrum and they kill everything. And many of these can have direct harmful effects on beneficial insects and mites, also called natural enemies, and also pollinators, including honeybees and bumblebees. In addition, if these materials are used on a regular basis, then you can stimulate spider mite outbreaks. Why is that? Well, many of these broad spectrum materials will kill the beneficial mites that are naturally regulating the pest mites. And in midsummer, late summer, I'll get phone calls people indicating why are, you my, why are my euonymus bushes losing their leaves in the summertime? I asked them, have you used seven or a broad spectrum insecticide? They say yes. How often? Uh, three days per week. So what happens is what they've done is they've killed all the beneficial mites and the two spotted spider mites now have nothing to regulate their populations and they start feeding on euonymus bushes and that's why they're losing their leaves in late summertime. So when you're using these, you get to ex use extreme caution in terms of the timing of application, apply them in the morning when bumblebees and honeybees are less active. So here is what's commercially available for Japanese beetle adults, orthene or acephate, carbril, which is the active ingredient in seven. However, I need to point out that carbril is being phased out. The new active in seven is actually zeta cypermethrin. These four right here are pyrethroids, pyrethroid insecticides. Um, imidacloprid is good. This last material is very, very effective. However, it is extremely harmful to the plants, but there is a psychological satisfaction knowing that you've killed every Japanese beetle within a five mile radius. So seven, uh, Carbril, now it's also got zeta cypermethrin and it is one of the most widely used insecticides for Japanese beetle. However, uh, one of the ne uh, negative aspects of using seven is it's directly harmful to bees and also natural enemies. So if seven is used on a regular basis, you can actually stimulate pest outbreaks, primarily two-spotted spider mite, but also scale. Here's an example of seven dust on flowers. Uh, I don't like dust formulations because of the issue of the coverage, uh, but a lot of people do use seven to protect the roses from Japanese beetle. Well, in addition to bagworms, this method is really good on Japanese beetles, but still we're holding off as an extension recommendation using this uh, tool at this point because of some negative aspects. Well, uh, I just, I did, this year I worked on another extension publication and I just got a new one called Japanese Beetle Insect Pest of Horticultural Plants and Turf Grass. And it is also available from the KSU bookstore. Let's move on to pest number three, mosquitoes. 
and mosquitoes do have a place in the ecosystem. They are, they are uh, part of the food chain. They're a food source for many insects. However, it's very hard to convince people that when they're being sucked up dry by mosquitoes. Well, first of all, what are the mosquito types? We have the floodwater mosquito, that's 80 species. And then we have the freshwater stagnant water ones, which are Anopheles or Culex. As you know, mosquitoes are vectors of many, many uh, destructive or harmful diseases to humans. Culex pipiens, which we have in Kansas, is called the common house mosquito. It vectors West Nile virus and St. Louis encep equine encephalitis. It tends to bite inside or outside, usually at sunset or night. Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus are the vectors of yellow fever, dengue fever, encephalitis viruses, and also Zika virus. The 80 species tend to bite outside during the daytime. Anopheles, uh, which we don't have many species, at least we don't, uh, we don't have Anopheles quadrimaculatus, which is the vector of malaria, they tend to bite at night. Well, let's go over the mosquito life cycle. The eggs are laid by the female. Uh, the, Culex pipian, the Culex species tend to lay them in a raft, whereas the Anopheles and Aedes kind of lay them singularly on, on the water. Then you have the larval stage, also called uh, basically the wiggler. Then they become a pupa, which we call the tumbler, and they come out as an adult. As you can tell, most of the life stages are associated with water, and that is stagnant water. The life cycle from egg to adult is usually about 14 days, depending on the temperatures. So how do you avoid getting bitten by mosquitoes? Number one, we call source reduction. That is eliminate or reduce all mosquito breeding sites by removing stagnant or standing water that collects in wheelbarrows, pet food or water dishes, old tires, bird baths and dishes. Number two is personal protection, which involves avoid going outdoors during dawn or dusk when mosquitoes in most cases are active. If you do go out, you want to use a repellent, and the most common one is either DEET or Picardian. These will keep the mosquitoes from biting you. You can also apply DEET or permethrin. Permethrin is a pyrethroid-based insecticide that you can apply to your clothing, but you cannot apply it to your skin because it is an insecticide, okay? But you can apply it to your clothing. It directly kills mosquitoes because it is an insecticide. Number three is you can use these mosquito dunks or mosquito bits, and these contain another soil-borne bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis. Now, remember when I talked about bagworms, I talked about Bacillus thuringiensis kirastaki. That is specific for caterpillars. This one is specific for fungus gnat larvae and mosquito larvae, and that is it. It's a very selective insecticide. Now, what are the, the question is, what are mosquitoes attracted to? They're attracted to carbon dioxide. They're attracted to heat. And that's why we recommend people don't wear dark colored clothing in the summertime because the heat builds up and the mosquitoes are attracted to that. They're also attracted to lactic acid, which comes from sweat. And I'm looking at a new study that shows that beer consumption increases human attractiveness to mosquitoes. So if you're having a beer party later on this week, you might want to think about that because mosquitoes are actually attracted to individuals after they have uh, drank some beer. What brand, I do not know. This is without a doubt, the number one way to avoid getting bit by mosquitoes, but also protect yourself from coronavirus. It's not the most fashionable statement you'll have out there, and it is going to get hot in July, but I can guarantee you mosquitoes will not bite you, and you get the added benefit of protecting yourself from the coronavirus. Okay, what are some of these breeding sites? Old tires, no doubt about it. The reason why old tires are a great breeding ground for mosquitoes is when water collects in there and then debris gets in also in the tire and the tire is black so it basically builds up heat. It's a great source of food for mosquito larvae. So that's one of the reasons why old tires are great. Bird bass are another great breeding ground for mosquito larvae. And here is a poster from the Kansas Department of Health and Environment talking about preventing mosquitoes by removing your old tires or getting, away, getting them away from the environment. 
Okay, now let's talk about repellents. Repellents are effective against mosquitoes. DEET is still the standard and you don't need any more than 30% DEET, over 30% over is overkill. Uh, DEET gives you about eight to 10 hours of protection. But remember, you have to spray every part of your body. Any part that you missed, mosquitoes will find. Well, there are other non-DEET materials. One of them is oil of lemon eucalyptus. Now, one of the problems with these is they don't last as long. Uh, I'm not sure you'll get six hours of control or repellency, but normally it's around two to three hours. And also, they don't repel against ticks, chiggers, noceums, and some of the other biting arthropods that are out there. Okay, now we will look at number three, and that is the use of mosquito dunks on the left and mosquito bits on the right. Remember, this is Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis. It's only going to kill mosquito larva, and that's it. So you can put these in your fish ponds with koi or other fish. You can put them in your pet dishes, and they will not be affected at all. What you do is you put these in the water. As the material dissolves, the larva feed upon it, and then consequently they will be killed, and you're not going to get adults uh, in the next generation. Okay, let's move on to pest number four, ticks. Ticks of Kansas. We have quite a few ticks. Uh, the number one is American dog tick, Dermacenter variabilis. It is the vector of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. We also have Lone Star tick. If you're not familiar with that name, Lone Star tick is associated with the meat allergy. We call alpha galactase. If you're bitten by a lone star tick and later on you eat some red meat, you might have an allergic reaction. We do have the brown dog tick. And unfortunately, we do have the black legged tick, which is the vector of Lyme disease. Uh, there's approximately between 12,000 and 15,000 cases of Lyme disease in the United States. It is a serious problem, and we do have it in Kansas. Let me give you a little bit tick biology and ecology. Ticks feed on humans and animal blood. They feed on mice, rats, deer, other vertebrates that are out there. What they do is they tend to crawl on grasses and weeds and brush waiting for a host. And on this image on the lower left, you'll see that the uh, six out of the eight legs are extended. We call that questing. And so what the ticks will do is they'll pick up vibrations and they'll extend their, their six legs, leave two of them to hold on to the grass, and they'll wait for some host, whether it be a human or animal, to come by. Ticks, hard ticks, like unmanaged areas. So one of the best ways to avoid tick problems is to weed eater mow areas. And what that does is it, re it reduces the humidity. Hard ticks like very high humidity and moist conditions. And they don't like sunlight. That's why they're usually in unmanaged areas. So if you can mow areas or use weed eaters to regulate unmanaged areas, that will also decrease the prospects of running into tick issues. I cannot stress it enough. When you're bitten, be sure you identify the tick because like I mentioned previously, we have the tick vectors of many diseases that are out there. Okay, let's go over a little biology. The eggs are laid by the female. We have a larval stage and then a nymphal stage. Both of them feed on blood from mammals. And then the, the females will then start feeding. The males do not uh, feed on blood. It's primarily the females. They require the blood uh, for egg production. Just, just like mosquitoes do. Mosquito females uh, feed on blood uh, to, to obtain the protein and amino acids for egg production. The males do not. The males primarily feed on nectar. So here is some of the life stages. Right here is the early larva we call the sea tick. And the sea tick is very, very hard to see with the naked eye. Then we have the, the, the nymphal stage. And then here's the adult. Now hard ticks, when they get on your body, don't directly start feeding. They wander around a little bit. So that gives you some time to come home, take a shower and remove them. The adult tick, which is shown on the far right, that's how we identify them. They have a hardened scutellum and that's the easiest way to identify ticks is the adult stage. 
So this is a Lone Star tick. And the reason they're called Lone Star tick because of the dot on the back. This structure right here is the hypostomy. This is what they use to embed themselves in human skin. And then they'll with, the females will start, start withdrawing blood. If you pull a tick out and that breaks off, then you need to go to the doctor because that can result in a second bacterial infection. Here's an example of an unengorged female lone star tick and an, a gorged female lone star tick. This is the case. They've been sucking up blood. She'll either lay eggs on the host or fall off and lay eggs in the location where she has dropped off. Okay. Well, how do you remove ticks? It's not rocket science. There's a lot of misinformation on the internet regarding using Vaseline, kerosene, gasoline, Bic lighters. By the way, uh, after applying kerosene and gasoline, I would not use a Bic lighter after that. Uh, there's a lot of other misinformation out there, but it's as simple as this. Take tweezers, get right close to the head and gently, don't twist or anything, gently lift them up and you want to get that hypostomy out of there because if it's still in the wound or where the area where the tick fed, it can cause a bacterial infection. Once you remove them, then you want to sterilize that with rubbing alcohol, iodine, or some type of peroxide solution. After removing the tick, put it in alcohol and get identified. Don't try to squish it, don't try to flush it down the toilet, but get identified as soon as possible. Now, not all ticks are bad. There's a bluegrass band called the bloated ticks. And if anybody out there has a CD or cassette, um, I'd appreciate you send it to me. I've heard they're pretty good. They're not the same as Bill Monroe and the bluegrass boys, but I understand they're, they're not too bad. So not all ticks are bad. You have to understand that. So what are the guidelines that will help protect you from ticks? And not just ticks, but other biting orthopods, including chiggers and mosquitoes. Use repellents. Uh, DEET is still the best one because it gives you about 8 to 12 hours of repellent activity. Uh, remember, DEET is kind of oily. It's hard on rubber. So after coming inside, be sure to wash your clothes and take a shower. You want to wear light colored clothing, white or yellow. Uh, because those are less attractive to mosquitoes. Remember, uh, blue or black colored clothing uh, retains heat, and that'll be attractive to mosquitoes. When you're outdoors, insert your, your uh, pant legs in your socks, white socks. That way you can see the ticks uh, that'll be on there. Check When you come back from being outdoors, check yourself thoroughly and wash your clothing, especially when you're visiting areas that are unmanaged or there's a risk of having ticks in that, in that environment. Shower within two hours of coming indoors. Remember I told you that hard ticks don't immediately embed themselves into your skin. So when you come in, you have this window of opportunity to take a shower and remove the sea ticks before they start embedding their feet, uh, mouth parts into your skin. And again, uh, ticks like unmanaged areas because there's, there's less sunlight, higher humidity. So if you regularly mow or weed eat, that will reduce tick populations. And I can't stress it enough. This not only protects you from mosquitoes and coronavirus, but also ticks. It's not fashionable. We do have some people that are uh, painting them purple for Kansas State and some blue for University of Kansas. Uh, so you can make up your own designs. But if you want to avoid to get bitten by ticks, mosquitoes, and avoid the coronavirus, this is, the, this is what you want to do. It's absolutely great. However, it will get hot in the summertime. We do have a very good extension publication, although it is 16 years old on ticks, but I do recommend you can download online. It talks about the various ticks we have and how to deal with them uh, more extensively than I have during my presentation this morning. Now, what about some other related bug pests out there? Well, uh, squash bug is out already. Striped cucumber beetle, spotted cucumber beetle are out. Two-spotted spider mite will be out shortly if the environmental conditions and the temperatures continue to increase. Grasshoppers are out there. The nymphs are feeding on just about everything. And we have the oakley fitch mite. The oakley fitch mite 
populations will be contingent on if the pin oaks have the oak, the marginal leaf oak gall folder. If you see your pin oaks with the leaves folded on top of themselves, then you run the risk of getting oak leaf mite. And I wanna, I wanna give acknowledgement to Matthew McKernan down in Sedgwick County, this image on the right. This is the oak leaf mite larva feeding on the larva of the midge that causes those galls. So later on in the summertime, if you notice that your pin oaks are getting, the leaves are starting to curl upon themselves, well, that could, that could lead to a potential issue with oak leaf itch mites because the oak leaf itch mites use that uh, midge as a food source. Okay, well, when all your meetings are canceled and you have to stay home or come to work at a limited basis, what do you do? Well, you work on extension publications. And in the last two years, uh, when working on a number of them, uh, one was on aphids, oak leaf itch mite, bagworm, grub management turf grass, scale, insect and mite pest of vegetable gardens, Japanese beetle, and the newest one that just came out called cross striped cabbage worm. And I've already finished white flies and I just finished elm leaf beetle. So there'll be two more coming on down the line. You can always get these from the bookstore at KSR, KSRE website. These have been designed to help extension agents and homeowners deal with the common insect pests that we have in Kansas. And we have already talked about bagworm and Japanese beetle during this presentation. In addition, uh, we're also revising the tree and shrub problems in Kansas guide. Uh, Megan Kennelly, Judy Amar, myself and Jason Gribben were contributing authors. And I understand that Megan Kennelly is in the process of uh, getting the information and getting it to the appropriate sources to get this updated, hopefully for this year, uh, as soon as possible. You know, our 16th president was a pretty astute gentleman. He said this, don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it. Abraham Lincoln was a very smart individual, but remember the internet is a source of information pollution. And there's a lot of misinformation about bagworm, Japanese beetle, mosquito and ticks. So be careful what you read or get off the internet. I have a question for everyone out there. I have been drinking this stuff for about a month and I wonder, does it actually make you smarter? Um, I maybe not drinking enough at the same time, but you know, marketing and advertising drive anything. If anybody has any data to show that if you drink this stuff, it makes you smarter, I would really, really appreciate it. So just a little bit of side note there. So that's all we have. Uh, this is question time. Any feedback you have regarding this presentation would be most appreciated. I hope you had a lot of fun, but however, I do have three questions that Cheryl Boyer passed on to me that I think are good questions that elaborate on. Question number one, is there any way to control chiggers? Well, you can use repellents. Most of the DEET formulations and others will repel chiggers in addition to ticks and mosquitoes. I do not recommend going out there and blanket spraying the air for chiggers as well as mosquitoes because those really don't work. So if you're gonna go out in an unmanaged areas, be sure to put on a repellent. Question number two, I use a mosquito magnet. Those of you that don't know what those are, they're devices you put out in your yard and they attract they attract mosquitoes. However, they don't attract all species. And this is where the question is, what species of mosquitoes do we have in Manhattan, Raleigh County? Well, we have, we have Culex pipians, we have uh, Aedes albopictus, and we have Anopheles and other species. So we have uh, quite a few species in Raleigh County, Kansas. So when you're using mosquito magnets, you need to know what species are out there. And Asian and tiger, actually it should be the Asian tiger mosquito, that's all the same. And then we do have Culex pipians, which is the vector for West Nile virus. Question number three was how to control caterpillars on fennel, but still allow them to mature to butterflies. Well, I was struggling through that. And to me, the easiest way is pick them off and put them somewhere else. 
or grow extra fennel. Um, I don't really think you need to spray anything to control the parsley worm caterpillars that will develop into the black swallowtail adults, which are very beautiful. So uh, those are some additional questions that came in prior uh, to the presentation. So with that, I hope everybody had a good time. We learned something, we had some laughs, but with that, I am done. So I appreciate everybody's attention. Thank you very much. Well, hey, Raymond, we do have some other questions from the chat. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and kind of run down the list. You did get some answered, but um, we don't have too many, so I think we'll make it through. <laughs> okay. So what bugs eat bagworms? What bugs eat bagworms? Uh, not much. Uh, there's been some great studies that show that vertebrates won't touch bagworms. And the reason why? The bagworms are hidden in the bags. The bag protects the caterpillars from a lot of predators and even a lot of parasitoids. So unfortunately, there's not a lot of good natural enemies. Even birds will not feed on bagworms because uh, they, they're protected in that nice bag. Perfect. Thank you. We had multiple questions related to squash bugs and the prevention of them. Um, what advice do you have to prevent them? Okay, so, so squash bugs, you have to understand they overwinter as adults in debris. So what I recommend as a prevention is to uh, rake up or clean up all your debris at the end of the season and don't provide overwintering sites for the adult stage of the squash bug. Once the squash bugs are out, there's nothing you can do other than hand pick or spray with an insecticide. Perfect, thank you. Um, next question, is it a good thing for my garden to, is it a good thing in the garden to find an assassin bug on um, a petunia? Uh, yeah, assassin bugs or kissing bugs are predators. They primarily feed on caterpillars, um, but they don't distinguish between good or bad. I would say they're a generous predator. Uh, I would think that having them like praying mantis is an indication you have a healthy ecosystem. So I would, I would say yes. Great. Um, what recommendations do you have for hand-picking bagworms and taller trees, you know, hard to reach places? Uh, that's a really good question. And uh, what you're going to have to do is run a cherry picker or you just can't get at them. I know that these tall windbreaks and stuff, um, and when you're talking about lots of them, it's going to be very labor intensive to do that. Yeah. Um, and then kind of seconding that, like when is the best time to pick the um, bagworms off the pods? Well, uh, you can do it now, but really the best time to do it is in late fall winter time when you can distinguish between the male and female bags. And that's when the eggs are going to be in those bags. And I mentioned earlier, I'll, I'll reiterate it, between 500 to 1,000 bags. So every time you remove a bag, female bag, just think th psychologically that you're removing potentially 500 to 1,000 larvae from the next season. Uh, the male bags you don't care about. They don't have anything in them, but it's those female bags uh, that are going to have those eggs. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch over to some mosquito questions. So mm -hmm. someone had asked, do frogs and toads eat mosquitoes? Yeah, let, let me take a sip of my Jack Daniels. I'll be right back. <laughs> ah, good stuff. Okay. Go ahead, Brooke. Um, do frogs or toads eat mosquitoes? Uh, yeah, th they can if they can catch them, but they obviously won't eat enough of them. So they can't. It's, it's like bats. Uh, people say, well, bats eat mosquitoes. Yes. The problem is that uh, mosquitoes are not a good protein source for bats. So they're, it's not their favorite food source. But they have to eat a lot of bat uh, mosquitoes to really impact the populations. So Toads and mosquitoes, toads and frogs will eat them, but really they will not eat enough of them to impact the populations. Okay, that's a good response. And um, I knew we kind of had a couple questions. You had mentioned some products that you can add to water, you know, for mosquitoes. Someone had asked what can be added to a lagoon for mosquitoes, and I think you kind of hit on that, but um, I don't know if that is too large of a scale for what you were talking about. Well, a lagoon or like a lake, uh, a pond, if they're, if they're concerned about impacting the fish populations, they can also put those mosquito dunks or flakes on there. And that, again, will not harm any uh, fish or frogs or any vertebrates in there. It'll only kill mosquito larvae. Um, However, if it's, if it's a very dirty lagoon, uh, the material may not be as effective as it would be like in a, in a fish pond or uh, where there's a not, not a lot of detritive or organic matter in the pond. Okay. And then we, like seconding that, we had a couple of questions related to bird baths. Um, 
you know, I, I know typically what I would do is just kind of wash out the bird bath and, you know, just refresh the water, but what products would you recommend for a bird bath? Uh, the same materials, uh, Brooke, as the mosquito dunks or the, or the flakes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, are mosquitoes attracted to chlorinated pools? Uh, that's a great question, and uh, I, I, I've not seen research to show. I have not seen research to demonstrate that they actually are attracted to chlorine pools. They will be attracted to the people in the pool, but I don't know if it's the chlorine. Okay. Um, we have a couple questions coming through. I'm going to kind of cruise through the questions that we we had earlier before I go to the most recent questions. But um, I know you answered a question about the mosquito magnets, and yes, they're effective. Um, here's another well, question. Brooke, they can be affected, but it depends on the species of mosquito that you're dealing with. Yeah. Perfect. What is the habitat for ticks and do they drop from trees in wooded areas? Um, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, ticks normally do not inhabit trees. They like it down in unmanaged areas like uh, unmet wood lots or if you're taking a walk and, and part of its mode, the other part that's not mode, that would be a very good environment. Remember, hard ticks, they're hard and soft ticks. Hard ticks like, uh, don't like sunlight and they don't like uh, very low humidity. They like high humidity, moist conditions, and that's why you're going to find them more so in the unmanaged areas than you would in areas that have been mowed or weed eated. Great. Um, we had a couple questions. Where and how do you get a tick identified? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I do identify ticks. Um, so extensions still exist in, in entomology, but yeah, I, I, will, I will identify ticks. Uh, you can send samples to me. Um, I can provide you the address if you email me and I can do that. It's, but if I get a sea tick or a nymph, it's much harder for me. I really want the female adult in order to make a really good accurate uh, a, a diagnosis. Yeah. Perfect. Um, okay, so I'm going to switch over to some of the questions that I just saw come through. Um, someone had a question about black blister beetles um, and what to do about them. Okay, black blister beetles, there's also the gray one. Um, uh, you, you can hand pick them, but remember, because they give off a cantharidin, which is a, a very toxic material, uh, you wanna wear gloves. You can spray them if you want to, uh, but those are, the, those are the means of dealing with either the black or the gray uh, blister beetles. Okay, and then we had a question, is there anything that can be done about pin oak leaf galls? Pin oak leaf galls, uh, no. Uh, pin oak leaf galls, uh, remember the galls are not going to harm the pin oak trees. They need it for survival, but you can't do anything spray or whatever to deal with those. Okay. Um, relating back to the squash question, do you have any insecticide recommendations for controlling squash bugs? Um, you can use the common pyrethroids, basically bifenthrin, cyfluthrin, zeta Um Just remember that you don't want to spray when honeybees or bumblebees are out. Um, and you want to direct your sprays at the adults or nymphs. Remember, the adults and nymphs will be active simultaneously. Um, uh, I would avoid seven as much as possible. So some of those pyrethroids I mentioned under Japanese beetle will also give you uh, control or be effective against squash bug. Okay. Um, and then someone had a question about flea beetles on eggplant. <laughs> yeah, uh, flea beetles are probably about the same. Uh, use one of the pyrethroid insecticides. Uh, those tend to be very effective on, on flea beetle adults feeding on eggplant. Uh, if you're, if you're going to, if you're going to spray them on a vegetable, um, be sure you apply them before the post harvest interval. I know we asked about um, frogs and toads eating mosquitoes, but what about dragonflies and birds eating mosquitoes? Okay, birds uh, don't eat many mosquitoes. They are defined, but dragonflies will eat mosquitoes. And uh, the problem is that dragonfly adults are only out one month out of 12. Most of the dragonfly life cycle is in the water. That includes the eggs, the larvae, and the nymphs. So um, they're good predators. But the problem is they're not they're only out for about a month. Um, they will eat mosquitoes though. Yeah, they're, 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 dragonflies are fantastic insects 
from a standpoint of their maneuverability and how they fly and they're good predators. However, they will not eat enough mosquitoes to impact populations primarily because they're only out for about one month out of the year. Okay. Um, so are there other predators like in addition to the dragonflies um, that would kind of hunt for mosquito larvae in ponds and lakes? Well, the mosquito larva, you can use the mosquito dunks or the, uh, the uh, uh, mosquito flakes for the larva. Uh, there's a, a fish called the gambusi fish. Gambusi fish will uh, feed on mosquito larva, but I don't know uh, their availability in Kansas. The adults, uh, it's pretty much bats will eat them, uh, dragonflies. Um, those are the primary predators. Uh, liz lizards will eat them. You know, t uh, you know, snakes will eat them if they can find them, but that's about it. Perfect. So someone said their grandmother used a garlic water spray in their garden to control pests. Do you know if this is a myth or helpful? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on the concentration. Uh, garlic tends to be more of a repellent than a contact insecticide or miticide. So um, if you're going to use garlic, you want to use the commercially available products. And there are several out there. One's called Garlic Barrier. Um, but uh, some of that is going to be a myth. Yeah. Okay. Um, so back to the mosquito magnet, do you know, would this harm desirable insects? Uh, no, it's specific for mosquitoes because what it does, it gives off carbon dioxide. And of course I mentioned carbon dioxide is one of the uh, means by which mosquitoes hone in on potential victims. So uh, the, the worst one is don't use bug zappers. Bug zappers are useless because mosquitoes are not attracted to the light. Those will harm beneficials more so than the mosquito magnets will. Perfect. So we just have a few more questions. So we'll probably only make it through a few more. So okay. um, any other questions, I'll probably kind of put to a halt. But um, how do you control lotus worms? Are there spray or are the sprays harmful to dogs? Uh, lotus worms? Uh, is that the same as dog heartworm or is that something else? Um, I don't know. Maybe Mary could clarify. We'll go to the next question and see yep. if she can clarify. Yeah, that, that would help me out tremendous if I could okay. get clarity on what that is. Um, what about a large population of assassin bugs? We're seeing quite a large amount of babies in our garden this spring. Um, well, that, those are good. Those are beneficial predators. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, ambush bugs or assassin bugs, they feed on caterpillars, but that's an indication you get a healthy ecosystem. Yeah. That's okay. Cool. Um, what are your thoughts on neem oil for some of the insects that you discussed today? Um, that's a great question uh, uh, because neem oil has been promoted for Japanese beetle adults. They, and uh, in the data that I've seen, uh, it's very inconsistent. Um, some Japanese beetles will drop, but then they'll come back to life. So really, to be honest, from an extension standpoint, I don't recommend neem oil, which is actually called clarified hydrophobic extract of neem oil on Japanese beetle adults. Now, neem oil uh, is good for soft-bodied insects like aphids, mealybugs, white flies, and even spider mites. But for Japanese beetle adults, uh, I, I, I can't recommend it. Okay, so I did get some clarification on the, the lotus worm question. She was um, referencing lotus plants in water gardens. And she said, um, there's a worm that will eat the lotus plants. That's right. There's one that eats the foliage. Yeah. Um, uh, that's, that's a Lepidoptera caterpillar. Uh, I would recommend Dipel, Bacillus thuringiensis kirstaki, because that'll only kill the, the, uh, the lotus caterpillar, but not harm anything else. Great. I think that answered that question. All right, this is the last question I think we have. So what is the best management method for grasshoppers? <laughs> um, giving kids a bad mitten racket and going outside. No, I think uh, that's actually a pretty good one, but really that, uh, I can't recommend sprays because the, the grasshoppers are coming in from all other areas. So uh, I don't have a silver bullet. I mean, basically- I feel like we just have to live with them, right? <laughs> Um, to be honest, yes, I, I really, because the insecticides are the pyrethroids, but when these things can fly as adults migrate in from other areas and hop because they do have the, uh, the, the, uh, the legs allow them to hop, 
you know, you're, you're going to be out there spraying all the time and that's going to have a potential negative indirect effect in the garden, you know, to kill the assassin bugs, kill uh, green lace wings, kill other beneficials that are part of the ecosystem. Yeah. Okay. I did miss one question and this will be our, our last one just for sake of time today, but will bagworms in, inhibit their old pods that are left on the tree? No, they will not. Uh, the, the males will not come back to those. And once the female dies and the eggs uh, eclose or hatch or the larvae emerge, they do not use those. And so some people get confused where they see uh, last year's bagworms on a tree and they think that bagworms are a problem. No, that was last year. So the bags will hang on the tree for years, uh, but they will not be reused by the next generation of bagworms. Great. Awesome job going through all those questions. I know that was a lot, Raymond. Um, I'm going to pass no it fun. back to Cassie um, to kind of close out our garden hour for today. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Raymond. That was some really great information. Um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today for the K-State Garden Hour series hosted by K-State Research and Extension. We were so glad that you could all come today and learn so much about um, those pests that we deal with every year in Kansas. So um, we have several other awesome webinars coming up. So be sure to visit our website to see all of our upcoming topics. Um, this session was recorded and it will be posted by tomorrow afternoon on the website um, that has been posted in the chat. You should also receive an email with an evaluation survey. So please um, fill this out. It'll really help us and we greatly appreciate your feedback. Um, if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at ksuemg at ksu.edu. So um, thanks again and we hope you have a great week.